On October 1st, 1962, the man who would become the undisputed king of late night television signed on for the first time. Johnny Carson hosted his first edition of The Tonight Show 50 years ago today, and he stayed in that chair for 30 years. Here to talk about why he simply was the best. Ralph Ben Mergy, who began hosting his own late night CBC talk show in 1992, the year Carson retired. And Alan Bonner, late night aficionado and the head of Alan Bonner Communications. Guys, this is going to be nostalgic, I think. Mm. Alan, start us off by telling us Johnny inherited that chair 50 years ago today. What was The Tonight Show at that mm. point and who had hosted it? Well, in the same way, John Stewart wasn't the first to do his show. Uh, Steve Allen had started in the early 50s on The Tonight Show, a late night uh, formula show with uh, many of the things that we see today on Letterman and elsewhere, the roving camera, the roving reporters, we see that on Leno and on Letterman. And uh, Steve retired after a while, very intelligent guy, wrote a thousand songs, um, smart, 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 like Cavett. Then Jack Parr. Jack Parr was probably one of the great monologists of all time told a beautiful story because a great lesson for people who have to make presentations in the boardroom or speeches at weddings. He would tell it three or four times to the stage hands and the sound guy and what have you. And then Parr left and came back under some controversy. He was a controversial guy. And NBC auditioned a lot of people. Their favorite turned out to be Merv Griffin. They had signed Johnny Carson, but there was a lag uh, between the signing and when Carson could take over. And Merv did so well, they actually tried to get out of the contract. Hmm. Uh, much like uh, some of the late night wars we've seen today. So there was great intrigue about it. And on he comes out of New York, 90 minutes with a formula, big band, author's spot, uh, opening monologue, comedians, and the rest is history. The rest is history. Warming he, up for Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He, he used to joke all the time about being from the, you know, the plains of Nebraska, where yeah. he grew up in the plains of Nebraska. But a lot of people thought that was kind of essential to his everyman quality and what made him funny. Do you see that? Yeah, because w the thing I think I enjoyed the most about him is I never felt like I was watching somebody who thought they were better. I just was watching someone who was just great at what they did. And he had that kind of ability. You know, when you watch his interviews, a lot of what they do in entertainment, late night talk show interviewing, is just waiting for their next opportunity for a joke. Mm. And the thing about Johnny is, if that, that was the case, if it was somebody doing panel, like stand-up comics who said, Give, feed me a thing about dogs and babies and I'll do all the bits, he was right there, he could top anybody. Mm. But when it came to just a real person sitting in front of him, he actively listened to them. He would just sit, you could see him sit back and just listen. And then he just became smaller at that point. And now you see a lot of these guys, they can't really stay small. They gotta be big through the whole, it's them doing the show and they're mm -hmm. gonna kill. And they're gonna make sure you look funny. And Johnny had a, a different ability than that. He didn't mind know? being and, in the in, yeah, in the and shadows I think it's also because shine. he was, you know, he wasn't just a, a comic. He was also a writer. I mean, his first gigs were as a writer. That's what he really wanted. And he wrote on the Red Skelton show, and uh, he, he was performing at the time, doing his own stuff. But he thought, no, I want to go and write for this guy. And that means you love the craft mm -hmm. more than you love whether you're on or not. A great, like a, a comedy writer has a great joke and thinks. That was great. Even after he retired, he would send jokes to Letterman. Yes, that's right. And Letterman would end yeah. up saying, I gotta use that, it's a great joke. I don't want to give him more credit than do, but if you look at the talk show that he essentially did, his Tonight mm. Show, opening monologue, a bit or a sketch, guest, guest, a bit, you know, musical number, something like that, it's essentially unchanged 50 years later. That's what all the guys today do as well. Did he invent the format? No, uh, it was uh, Steve Allen. Steve Allen mm. had, uh, I mean, some producer probably invented it, or it was a group of people, or it was whatever it was. But through the years, Steve Allen per, uh, perfected that, including many of the bits that Letterman still does today. When Letterman does a camera out on the street, that's Steve Allen. He did that first. Uh, so, sure. so I think, if, if, if I may uh, repose your question, sure. so what is it that made Carson so special? Mm -hmm. He probably wasn't as intelligent as Cavett or uh, Allen. Mm -hmm. He probably was a better interviewer than Cavett, let's say. Wasn't as controversial as uh, short-lived Geraldo Rivera with Great Night, Late Night America. Mm. 
And as a matter of fact, he was criticized in the early days for being a chameleon. I mean, one minute he's Bob Hope, but seriously, folks, let me tell you, and the next minute he's Groucho, and the next minute he's uh, Jack Benny with the big paws. Mm -hmm. But I think that was actually his strength. He not only co-opted all those bits, but he made them his own. Now, while you were taking the weekend off and relaxing, <laughs> Ralph, you know, Ralph was doing whatever he was doing. I was in the I, sauna. I, I was, we don't want to hear about that. Um, I was listening to Johnny Carson's 1949 undergraduate thesis on comedy, which no, I brought kidding. as a present. Where did he do you. this? He did this at the University of Nebraska. Now, I read a lot of academic literature, as I think you know, and I wrote my first master's paper on the history of Canadian broadcasting. This is a very scholarly, serious piece of work without being ponderous or pompous. You huh. can hear the voice. He voiced it in 1949. So he's in his 20s. Yeah. You can hear the strong voice and the, ser I won't say deadly serious, but he is as serious about his craft and art as you uh, are and Ralph is about his. What is a topper? What is a straight line? What is a topper that becomes a straight line that is then topped? What is a sight gag? What is a take? And he's got it all. I then, then I listen to, 20 years later, almost, 1968, someone interviews him. He is self-effacing, generous with his time. Uh, I don't know who did the interview. He's a person whose name is lost to history. But he spent about an hour with him analyzing after seven years on The Tonight Show, same level of detail. And I think the message is know your art and craft. If someone's watching this show, and it's an educational network, if they're a, 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 a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician, an electrician should know knob and tube wiring. Know your regimental history. Where, how did we get yeah, here? And know, he knew it. One of the interesting things, though, when, when I'm hearing you talk about that, and we talked before about his love of craft, is in a show like that, it, it is also one of the um, one of the format pieces of a show that has that kind of longevity is the writing room, and you don't have one or two people in there. You have upwards to right these days seventeen to twenty people who write in teams, write in couples, mm. but they write and they write. But you need somebody who really can cut away the chaff, cut away the chaff. So you give the monologue stuff to the, to the host, and the host is able to say, that's not me, I can't do that, I'll do that, I won't do that. And he had that ability, he had two great abilities as a monologist on his show. One was to be able to control his writing room and have them write to him. I mean, he managed to convey to them what voice he wanted, and they did it. And the other beauty of his monologue was that it was designed to fail. <laughs> right? Yes. You knew he wasn't going to make it through this without at least two of the jokes being groaners. But he was funny in failure. He was the best. <laughs> yeah, he and was. Uh, all he had to do was look over at the band and go, <laughs> you know, and I'm working. And start playing T for two and he yeah, tap dancing. I'm killing myself here. Yeah. And he always could, he could top his own material. And yeah. that was the genius of him. Because if he just had to hang on every joke, you see it on other guys and they sweat through it because that was the joke. And if it's not going to work, I've got a problem. <laughs> he didn't have that problem. So he was to comedy what Ted Williams was to hitting. He, he could not only be great at it, but he could explain why he was great at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Name, name who the greatest in any field yeah. was, and he was it. And again, it was his mm. versatility. Uh, as Ralph says, he could, he could recover. Uh, he would bring down the microphone and say, is this thing on? That's right, he banged uh, the boom Can, mics. can anybody yeah, yeah. hear this? Yeah. Or he would do what Bob Hope did. And this is much more complex than people think. Bob Hope would talk way past his punchline. Mm -hmm. Say, but really what I want to tell you is, folks, and if the audience laughed, he'd stop. If they didn't laugh, they told another joke. Mm. George Burns would smoke until the audience laughed. <laughs> Just sit there and smoke. Jack Benny would stare. Yeah. Carson would do all of that and more. Yeah. yeah, you gave a good list of all of the different skills he had a moment ago, and, and some of them are evident in this clip. This is pretty early Johnny Carson from 1964 with Zsa Zsa Gabor. Roll tape, please. Oh, Mr. Chan, thank heaven you came. My life is in danger. Tell oh, Johnny Tran the details. He's at your disposal. Oh, a man called me and he said he's going to kill me. There, there was a bomb thrown into my house. My, my brakes in the car were broken. Yeah. And a great big safe fell almost on my head. What makes you think your life is in danger? <laughs> oh, you must help me. Please, please. You must. You must help me. Johnny, well, I'll help you. But please, please. Help me. Oh, 
muscle yourself into things, don't you? I do. I got carried away. I wasn't supposed to pull the pants. No. Just the but coat. I got the coat. Well, but I, am, I suppose that's know. conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> I remember years later, Johnny once said, you know how to say breast in Hungarian? Ja. Ja, ja. He was pretty good at sketch comedy, eh? And he had a lot of characters who were, I mean, Alan, they were unforgettable. Karnak the Magnificent and, you know, yeah, and, and if, tea if, time with... If you look <laughs> at the documentary made for one of his last shows, as he's putting on the Art Fern tea time Art movie Fern. makeup. He is so intense. He's been at it 30 years. He was at it 10 years before that in other programs. And so intense and so professional at it. But you know, you raise his Achilles heel too with that clip, if I may say. Um, he did not grow with the women's movement and, and with liberation. It was still uh, a good dollop of scatology right through to the end of his career and a uh, a lack of uh, of progressing on on jokes about women and about big breasts. Dick Cavett says he wrote one of the best lines. He had to introduce Jane Mansfield, and his uh, line that he wrote for Carson was, "Ladies and gentlemen, here they are." <laughs> now, yeah. completely unacceptable by say the late '60s. Uh, so you know he wasn't perfect, but he but was you know, good. always got the feeling that. Carson really wasn't of the world in most cases. You felt like this is a guy who went home right after the show. Which he never did, actually. I know, but you felt yeah. like it. You felt like he was just going home, and uh, he was in his own kind of hermetic, like uh, 30 years of this, right? Mm -hmm. Where everyone you talk to in Hollywood wants something from you. Yeah. You can make or break them. And after a while, I think that kind of seals you off from all the trends, all the things mm -hmm. that were moving on. I saw a, a, a YouTube of of him with Don Rickles, where Rickles broke his cigarette box oh, yeah. and he has to go get it. The two things he says to the black actor uh, when he goes over to interrupt CPO Sharkey mm -hmm. are unbelievable. They like, couldn't be more racist. And, and yet, uh, at the time, that was the way he spoke mm -hmm. in the world he lived in and with no repercussion, right? He was Johnny Carson. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other part of it that I, I think it's well, important. Well, and Rickles was there, and that's the kind of joke of Rickles would and, make, and, too. And it would, yeah, and you feel he's channeling it, but on the other hand, you think this is what they probably did when they were sitting around spritzing, right? <laughs> Just going for that kind of jugular. Mm -hmm. But the thing I loved about him was the relationship he had with stand-up comics, because I was a, a young stand-up. I was a little kid watching Ed Sullivan and Johnny Carson. And that's where you saw careers made. Can we go to this now? I was going to come to this a little later, but since you brought it up. Uh, top of page three, can we roll this clip? Because you're right. Back in the day, before the Comedy Channel, before yeah. there were 20 talk shows in late night, uh, there was one guy, and if you killed on his show, your career was made. Uh, here's an example of somebody who did okay. Roll tape, please. I'm glad that you're all in a good mood tonight, because it's always a pleasure to introduce a new comedian to The Tonight Show. This young man's name is Jay Leno, and uh, this is his first appearance on The Tonight Show. Later. This year, he's going to make his film debut in The Silver Bears with Michael Caine, which is not bad. Would you welcome, please, Jay Leno. Jay. Yikes. Does anybody actually remember Jay Leno looking like that? Yeah, no, I remember that wig. <laughs> you remember yeah. the wig. But that, Leno came out killed and was off to the races. Letterman, same story. Jerry Seinfeld, well, same story. Well, there was story. a ritual to it. If he invited you to the couch to sit down... After your bit. Then you really had made it. Yeah. If you weren't invited to the couch to sit down, you might have been on the bubble or you just really didn't cut mm -hmm. it. And that was the thing. If he went, come on over. And I have friends who, as stand-ups, got on to the Johnny Carson show, and that was everything to them. Anybody get called over? Uh, Jim Carrey. John Wing, I, I don't know if John got uh, uh, asked over, but then John went on to do multiple appearances on Carson. Hmm. So uh, really, for uh, I, there was one guy, God love him, he was a, a stand-up in, in Toronto, but he was an American, I, I won't mention his name, but anyway, he finally got the call to be on that show, and he literally died just before he was supposed to go down to L.A. and do Oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> You're not going to tell us who it was? No, no, no. But it, it's too personal. But anyway, the guy, you know, you could just imagine his last words are like, I was booked for Carson. Unbelievable, <laughs> right? But that was power. He had the power to make you in a way that, I mean, oh, yeah. no one has that power anymore, do they? 
where one I, appearance no, on one show. Have, you probably have to do the circuit, yeah. but I think Letterman yeah. comes pretty close. But it mm. was a very, very special time, and it could make a, um, a singing act as well. John Denver co-hosted or hosted the show many, many times and screamed mm. far out over and over and over again. And I think his career was much enhanced by that. Let's not forget that Johnny wasn't out there by himself. He had a guy sitting beside him for 30 years named Ed McMahon. Let's show a bit of him at work. Roll tape, please. Here's Johnny! Television's original sidekick, Ed McMahon, helped The Tonight Show hit its highest notes playing second fiddle. May I have silence, please? Yes. You've had it many times before. McMahon and Johnny Carson were a team on The Tonight Show from 1962 to 1992. Two guys, Ed has been a rock for 30 years sitting over here next to me. Reach the can that contain real beef. Their friendship lasted well beyond the final episode. We're good friends. You cannot fake that on television. I thank you. My family thanks you <laughs> forever. Thank you, sir. On the occasion of Ed's obituary Fantastic. A few and, years ago. And when uh, Ed talked about John, he said he's my brother. Mm. They, they did a game show together before they did yeah. that. Who That's where they met. Who yeah. you and then they did that. But, you know, it, it, that part of the, of the sort of archetype of the talk show, I don't know who, who could have done it better. 30 years with the mm. same guy beside you. It was mm. just brilliant. I loved his stuff. Alan? Uh, well, just unbelievable challenge as well and you know from from your business live commercials mm -hmm. uh, that's why the Alpo commercial went the way it did they couldn't get the dog to eat the food and Carson <laughs> saved the uh, the day long before um, Jeopardy where you asked the or gave the answer and then asked the question Carson divined <laughs> in his mystical way now do you, do you want to do it, or do you want me to do it? Who's going to play which role? Here? We're, we're doing the card. Do you want me to set you up? Okay. Yeah, sure. All right. Sis, boom, ba. At which point Ed would say, sis, boom, ba. Does Karnak not speak clearly? Sis, <laughs> boom, ba. Sorry, Karnak. And the question <laughs> is, <laughs> name the sound an exploding sheep makes. <laughs> I mean, I know cornball, but it, you, 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 they were good though. They we worked. waited for those stock bits yeah. every week. And, you know, something we haven't talked about is the political part. You know, where he became sort of, and you could argue. I'm sure if you're doing a PhD dissertation on how he he really by commenting on politics managed to diffuse what was really at stake in the political landscape of America by saying, it's a joke, guys, don't worry mm -hmm. about it, that guy's funny. But on the other hand, he was one of the few who could articulate and capture the zeitgeist of, uh, uh, of things mm -hmm. on the night. Was he a Republican or a Democrat? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? So, like a good journalist, yeah. you just couldn't figure him out that yeah. way. Yeah. Let, let me build on what Ralph said, because I think this is really important. He, his longevity was in part because we don't know which he was. Uh, remember, in his ascendancy between 55 and 65, we had Lenny Bruce uh, kill himself and, mm. and degenerate into reading his own court transcripts in nightclubs. We had Mort Saul inherit the political side of that humor and get kind of too strident and hectoring. Uh, we had um, George Carlin come up and, and go blue eventually. Uh, Johnny Carson would, would joke about both sides, Republican and Democrat, uh, he joked about Watergate pro and con, mm -hmm. and he remained just a little above or beside the fray so that he, he didn't get tired like mm -hmm. Bob Hope. Bob Hope was just known as a Republican defending Nixon at the time. Right. Carson stayed above the fray. I'm going to give a list here of names. Ayn Rand, mm. Bennett Cerf, William Buckley. Can any of you, can either of you, imagine any of those guests on Jimmy Kimmel or David Letterman mm -hmm. or... Jay Leno. I mean, Johnny interviewed public intellectuals. Mm -hmm. Only John Stewart. You can imagine the Stewart, could, but Stewart. he's not got a classic talk show in the way that Johnny did. No, he's a parody yeah. of a talk show yeah. that Johnny did. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it, it works for that. But you know, uh, let's also remember how little competition there was. And mm -hmm. the question is: Is it because he managed to kill all competition? Yes. Or, or was it because? Most of the other networks really didn't think that's where their uh, income uh, generating revenue was going to appear because, you know, late night didn't make the same kind of m money as other parts of your schedule did. You didn't have as large an audience. 
So who knows? I, I'm not, I don't really know what the machinations were behind the scenes to say I will neutralize this competitor. But at a certain point, competitors came from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then Carson was no longer alone in his, his, his ability to do the way Koppel was no longer alone in his ability to do a, a current affairs show at late night. Uh, uh, let's keep the list of intellectuals uh, going, and re regrettably it's going to exclude the three of us, but um, <laughs> he also had on uh, Eric von Doniken, uh, chariots of the Gods and talked about mm -hmm. the time-space continuum uh, effortlessly. He had on Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan and talked often. about space. In the 68 interview that I just listened to, um, the interviewer casually says, well, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said the following in one of his essays and uh, S.J. Perlman said this and Carson comes back with an answer because he knows his regimental history. Mm -hmm. And this is a Letterman idea, but I'll, I'll steal it for today. If you were a young man uh, growing up in the, in the 70s, that's where you wanted to be, on the couch with Johnny and Doc and Ed, because that was witty, it was intellectual, mm -hmm. it was clever, it was suave. Uh, was I cool. remember being, being in, in high school and not actually being able to stay up that late. I just couldn't stay up that late. I fell asleep. But that's where adults were. And that was a role model. And I can tell you, I, I've got to apologize to great old broadcasters, in, uh, Terry White, Eric Forbes, the late Kevin McGowan, Peter Downey, who I grew up in campus radio with, because I'd go in the next day and do Carson's material uh, to see if I could pull it off. And you can't. Well, Ra Ralph will, will attest, you can't deliver somebody else's no. material. No, but I don't all know if well. people realize it. People who are under 50, who you know, obviously never would have seen the show, probably, we used to go into school the next day and talk about what we saw on the Carson mm. show the night before. I don't know well, if I was kind does of freaky. I, I would go in and talk about Wayne and Schuster, so it's a little different that way. You were a nerd. You were but a nerd. It, here's the thing. I, I don't know if I think he really was a repository for the intellectual, because uh, when Tom Snyder did the Tomorrow Show, then I got what I wanted from that kind of a conversation. The fact that it was cool was the bottom line. Yeah. So that an intellectual could go on in a cool setting. Look at what he did for Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton couldn't have been diving further into the abyss. Mm. And then he shows up on, uh, on Carson and he starts to look fantastic. Yeah. Then he does Arsenio and he looks even cooler. So, you know. Uh, gentlemen, look at the monitor over my shoulder. I'm gonna play a clip here. This may be somewhat reminiscent. Roll tape, please. Yeah, I told you to make a kid. Have a seat. How you did doing? a great job of the Gemini's, didn't he? Let's give him a hand. <laughs> I told him he'd make it. I said he'd make it. I heard you do your own makeup. I do. <laughs> hey, what do you think I wore that earwing last year for? What are you talking I about? I like yeah, that. Yeah. Okay, I'm just asking. Rush, did you blush or just I, I have blush here, yes, and then I finish it off with suntan. <laughs> it looks good on you. So this is what uh, Coach's Corner supports, eh, all this? Yeah, we're just doing oh, yeah. what we can. Yeah. He got you there. That was a yeah, good yeah. line. But then Scott Thompson comes in yes. and sits beside him, and which is even better. Uh, Ralph, this obviously was a clip from your TV show, Friday mm. Nights, which you, did, which you started the year that Johnny retired. Mm. And I want to know whether, as you were putting that show together, you would think to yourself, Johnny did it this way, therefore I'm going to do it this way, or Johnny did it this way, no. therefore we got to make sure we don't do it this way, or, you know, because he made, was huge yeah. on the scene and you, you had to have been influenced by him somehow. Of course, of yeah. course you are. I mean, there's elements, but what I was more influenced by, honestly, was Ed Sullivan. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to do was the Ed Sullivan show. Everybody wanted me to throw in these other elements, like a talk show element and this out. Well, you opened with a monologue. Right, but what I really wanted was an Ed Sullivan show where I could just say, here's Canadian talent, here's more Canadian talent, we've arrived, we deserve this, this is great. And then after, interestingly, after my show was Bullard's show, and Bullard's <laughs> show was exactly that format. <laughs> it was right down the pipe, and I thought, and it, you know, and it went on for five or six years that way, and I thought, well, you see, that people can relate to. I was trying to do something too different and too, too, too high status for what we were doing. I don't know, you know if you noticed this though, but there were, I watched a bunch of clips before selecting that one. You yeah. used to go like this a lot, Ralph. Yeah. Now I know where you got that from, Ralph. Yeah. Like Johnny did this, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and Johnny did this, he did that, like this. Alan's doing with the sleeves. I used to like stick that. my tongue in my cheek. Right That's right, you played with his tie. Just move around, yeah, yeah. You, you know, look. You, you probably unconsciously picked that up, you don't even know it. 
But, but you see, he's also part of the entire fraternity of what comedy is about, what the double take is, what the, what the spit take is, what the, what the pause is about. You know, with Jack Benny doing it, that pause, isn't Jack Benny. Every comic knows that rhythm, and he's a drummer. Johnny Carson yes. is a drummer. He, has a, he had pencils with erasers on either end, so he and he played them all the time, right. and he'd just be whacking away on a cigarette box, and then for many years, this is the last thing you saw when they came back from right. commercial. He was finishing a drag of a cigarette and he put yeah. it down. So he had all this stuff about who he was as a person that he managed to blend into, in, into things, but then they became everybody's, right? Alan, let's also acknowledge that his, while he was a master of the, the 90 minutes initially and then 60 minutes that was on television, his personal life uh, he was not in charge of. Uh, four marriages, hmm. all of which failed, um, and he'd joke about it on the air. How did he get away with being occasionally pretty tough on his exes on the air? Well, I guess it was Tinseltown. Uh, you know, that is just part of the, the shtick in Tinseltown. Um, and I, I forget who else has had a number of divorces, but, you know, it... Mickey it, it, Rooney had a bunch. Yeah, all right, Mickey yeah. Rooney, there you are. It, 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 and and uh, uh, Elizabeth Taylor yeah. had a lot of divorces. So I think that that became a stock shtick that he got away with. He also looked like Mr. Wholesome from the American Midwest. I mean, he was... You know, he wasn't. No, he was, no. But it was... He was it, what? For the, for the same <laughs> you reason... You gotta say it. Did he, Dre, he was, he was, he was he, a depressive... He, he'd go, yeah, he'd go out and he'd drink a lot after the show. Yeah. And, you know, why did kind Dick, of hang around with some of his guests who may have looked rather lovely. And Why know. did Dick Clark... Uh, uh, rise above Paola and Alan Freed, it, uh, it killed him because Dick Clark looked like a young, wholesome kid. Mm -hmm. Johnny Carson, I believe, from memory, was denied a license in Las Vegas yes. to operate a casino because of some association with unsavory characters. So, you know, there, there were complex aspects of the personality. One more complexity. I also used to watch five hours of news a day when I was coming up through radio and TV with those wonderful people I just mentioned mm -hmm. and many others. Uh, and I'd watch the American local news out of Bangor, Maine, you know, crazy, in Plattsburgh, New York, and then the network news, you'd see Cronkite and how good he was, and then the Canadian national news, and then the local American news, and then Carson. Mm. And there were many, many serious journalists like you, who I knew, who admired Carson's vocal quality, his delivery to camera, his sense of where he is, is this in the shot, is that in the shot? His interviewing when to skills. Take, his interviewing skills. He, he exposed Uri, Uri, he called him Uri, but Uri Geller, the spoon bender, he exposed him by simply waiting. <laughs> so spoon right. didn't bend, you know? <laughs> uh, and as you said, the interview with Ayn Rand and, and other stuff, he was, uh, he, he was a role model for very serious broadcasters as well. You know, his, wedding, his marriages weren't 10 minutes long, though. He had long marriages, mm -hmm. I guess, 15 years, 18 mm -hmm. years, 9 years. And they were separate. They weren't at the same time. No, yeah, yeah. they weren't co co concurrent. No. But I do remember him saying but, at one point, you know, next time I'm just going to find a woman I hate and buy her a house. Yeah. And that got a big laugh. Of course, because yeah. it's a good life. <laughs> uh, okay, guys, here's the list. David Letterman, Jay Leno, Jimmy Kimmel, Conan O'Brien, Merv Griffin, Joey Bishop, Dick Cavett, David Brenner, Joan Rivers, Arsenio Hall, um, who am I forgetting? Uh, Tom Snyder, I liked. Mm, sorry, yeah, well, he, he never went head to head oh, with uh, Carson. Thick no, no, no. Alan Thick. Alan Thick. Okay. The Canadian content. They and all, Geraldo Rivera. And Geraldo. They were all supposed to be, because Johnny wouldn't last 30 years, so they were all supposed to be the heir apparent. Did you get Peter Zosky in there? I did not put Peter on the list. 90 minutes live. Did anybody get close on that list? No, and every time somebody came, even when Zosky went on, and you knew Zosky, I'm sure, I knew Zosky. Um, they dressed him up and cleaned him up, and the comparison was to Carson, and that was ridiculous. The comparison should have been to Geraldo Rivera. This is a new generation talk show host who wears a, a denim shirt or something like that. I don't think anybody was a serious competitor. Hmm. Not a single one of those. I would say because all of these people owe so much to Steve Allen, he has to be considered seriously as... Hmm. as uh, and truly an innovator and a creative sure. Although uh, force. Although never competed with Johnny. No, but if it wasn't for Steve Allen, there would have been a Johnny. Right. So that you have to tip your hat to. And I would say David Letterman uh, was the one for me as I grew older that I thought, this is the next generation of what Johnny Carson should look like. Jay Leno never so did too. it. Yeah, and Jay Johnny? Oh, they were great friends. Yeah. And Jay Leno never looked like that to me. Mm. Jay Leno to me just looked like a, a PR agent in Hollywood who's just mm. doing the show. 
But Letterman had a point of view. He had a place he came from that could be unpredictable yeah. and hilarious. And he took a lot of what Carson had given him and put it up one level. And I, I was very sad when he didn't uh, uh, get to replace him directly and had to go to another network. I just thought that was a really timid move on NBC's part mm. at the time. Okay, let's finish up on this. Uh, your personal Carson connection. Any of you ever meet him, see a show in person, have some kind of brush with Carson, anything like that? Uh, no, I've seen uh, Stewart and I've seen Letterman and uh, had a client close to getting uh, invited on Carson one time and uh, that's about it. But it, the intimacy was, was every night uh, looking at him uh, you know, in the in the in the dark of the living room, mm. and it was just as if we did know him. And it's such a cliche; it's as if we did know him. Don't want to leave without mentioning Toot Sweet, the uh, little-known hit by Paul Anka that he rewrote and That's changed right. the tempo, and that became Johnny's theme. And he made three hundred bucks a night. There's your Canadian content yeah. for you on the Tonight Show. You know, I, I would say it didn't matter. That was the beauty of, of of the relationship anybody would have with Johnny Carson over the my whole life up until that point is what I knew. I remember when I went out to University of Alberta in the mid-70s, they didn't have NBC at the time. <laughs> they didn't know who Carson was. And I was like, you don't know who Johnny Carson is? And they were like, well, we've heard of him, but mm. we've never seen him. And for us, I knew that he was taping his show that afternoon and that it was going to be on that night. I knew that he was where you're supposed to aim as a stand-up. I knew that he was the, the, the benchmark of what showbiz should look like. Right? He was the epitome of uh, L.A., Las Vegas showbiz. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the time you saw the show, Steve. I, no, I was lucky enough to go see the show once in New York and then three times in, uh, in Burbank. But, um, but since you've asked... You saw New York pre-72? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, th yeah. I thought you were younger. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to show you something here. I don't think I've ever showed anybody this before. But once upon a time, when the Hamilton Tiger Cats were about to go under, Martin Short, who's from Hamilton, got all of his Hollywood buddies to bring some stuff to Hamilton and auction it off to raise money to save the team. So I bought this. Mm, wow. Now that is uh, you know, a mug that um, would have been on Johnny Carson's desk. And I remember uh, many years later, of course he signed it. There's his signature right there. And I remember many years after buying this, I did an interview with Ed McMahon who was on the lecture circuit flogging a book. And I showed him this mug and I said, you got to tell me, is this, you know, is, is this authentic or is this? And he said, well, I'll tell you. Johnny did have a lot of these mugs and he even signed a few of them. But he said, there isn't a single one in the whole world with his signature and mine. And he pulls his pen out and then he puts his signature on it as well. <laughs> and there's Ed McMahon's signature beside Johnny's picture beside Johnny's signature. So that's my little... So when you saw him live, was it different, better, electric? All of the above. Yeah. Just, yeah, I bet. you knew you were in the presence of greatness, and I also knew that when he left, uh, you know, we that. would never see the likes of him again. But we see seven shows like it. Yeah, yeah. but not it. Yeah, not yeah. it. Guys, thanks so much for this. Very right. reminiscent. The 50th anniversary of Johnny Carson's first ever Tonight Show. Thanks so much. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.